Hey, all right. So um, what I wanted to do is allow you a little opportunity to um, get a little head in lecture if you wanted to, as well as kind of giving a little supplement to what we'll talk about in lecture as well. So um, I'm going to break this up into a couple different segments so that you can take this in a little chunks at a time. Um, so we'll have a couple of these. All right. So what I want to talk about in this particular recording is enzymes, which we've already talked a little bit about in lab, but let's talk about it again. All right. So let's get on it. So this is where we left off in lecture last week. Um, again, we'll be pick up it, picking up in lecture tomorrow as well. Um, if you remember, what we've been talking about is energy conversions and the sum of an organism's metabolism. What it needs to do is convert energy basically from potential to kinetic or usable energy, stored to usable energy, or vice versa, usable energy into stored energy. We have the money in the bank if you gotta use it later, you know? So um, as we talked about, when we talked about transformations of energy, there are two ways we can classify reactions. We can classify them as endergonic or exergonic. Endergonic reactions are those that require energy. The reason they require energy is because we are building bonds. If we're building bonds, that means that the molecules going into a chemical reaction are smaller than the molecules coming out of a chemical reaction. So the reactants are smaller than the products. So again, you're adding bonds between them. So that's why we're going from small to large. If you're building bonds, this requires an investment of energy that you're storing in that bond. So this would be uh, called an endergonic reaction. You can see that the amount of potential energy stored in these molecules is relatively low in the reactants, higher in the products, again, because you're storing energy in chemical bonds. On the flip side, you can have exergonic reactions, and exergonic and exciting um, is what's happening. You're releasing energy. So that's what's shown in B. You can see that if you're releasing energy, you're releasing that energy from chemical bonds. So you're breaking chemical bonds. So what that means is your reactants are larger than your products, right? Because you're breaking them apart. So of course, you're breaking larger molecules into smaller molecules. When you break bonds, you release energy. So if energy is released from a reaction, that's what we call an exergonic reaction. Anything where we're building uh, molecules or building bonds, this would be an anabolic reaction. So anabolic reactions are endergonic reactions, whereas catabolic reactions are when we are breaking bonds. So catabolic reactions are categorically exergonic. So we're talking about chemical reactions. We're talking about transferring energy. And how do chemical reactions take place? Well, we had the question answered last time. Good job. Chemical reactions take place with the help of enzymes. So what are enzymes? Enzymes um, are molecules, typically proteins, but not always proteins. Um, but enzymes are what we call catalase, <laughs> catalysts, meaning they, they help speed up a chemical reaction. Or as we'll talk about, a lot of chemical reactions won't take place um, unless an enzyme is present to help it take place. And that's because chemical reactions require a significant amount of energetic uh, input to take place. But first, let's look at the structure of enzymes and what happens, um, how they mediate a chemical reaction. So this is just showing an enzyme. And every enzyme has uh, what's called an active site. So the active site is the area in which a chemical reaction takes place. So for example, if you're gonna have a chemical reaction take place that where like a bond is broken in the molecule, that molecule is considered the substrate, and a substrate fits in the active site of that enzyme. 
And that's how we would get the chemical reaction to take place. So let's say again that this is like uh, AB, right? So A and B are bound together. A and B would fit into the active site of an enzyme, and that enzyme would allow the bond to be broken between A and B. When we have a substrate bound to an enzyme in its active site, this is called the enzyme substrate complex. Basically, they're complexed together. So again, you have enzymes. Enzymes have active sites, and the active site is where the enzyme's substrate, which is the molecule that's going to undergo the chemical reaction, um, that's where that takes place, is in the active site. So enzymes are considered catalysts of chemical reactions. Anytime you hear the term catalyst, that means that it's going to help speed something up. In the case of enzymes, what they're speeding up is a chemical reaction. This can be a little confusing because uh, a lot of chemical reactions will not take place unless an enzyme is present. And this is because um, chemical reactions have what's called a barrier, and that barrier is called the activation energy. So let's look on the left. What we have is a reactant. So that's something that's gonna go into a chemical reaction, and it's just two molecules that have a bond between them. So what we wanna do is we wanna break that bond. Okay, so we wanna separate these two molecules. So that bond is really strong. And so it's not gonna just like spontaneously break, okay? That level of energy required to get that bond to break is called the activation energy. In order for that bond to break, you would have to overcome the amount of energy that's stored in that bond, basically. So under normal circumstances, that's not gonna happen. Okay, that bond's not gonna break. So the reason I say that the, a lot of chemical reactions will not happen without enzymes is because a lot, a lot of chemical reactions, which is breaking bonds, are not gonna happen spontaneously because we're not going to spontaneously overcome that activation energy barrier. So what enzymes do is enzymes basically function as catalysts. They speed this up by allowing this reactant, in this case the reactant is the substrate of the enzyme. Once that reactant or substrate fits into the enzyme, the enzyme kind of like makes that bond unstable. Or, or, I mean, it's not only gonna break bonds, they can also build bonds. So but basically what it's going to do is it's going to lower that barrier, that activation energy that would be required for that reaction to take place. So essentially what these do, what enzymes do, is they allow, they lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction. So they're considered catalysts because they, lower the amount of energy required for a reaction to take place. Theoretically, that reaction could take place without an enzyme, but for the most case in the body, a lot of these chemical reactions aren't gonna take place spontaneously. So enzymes are catalysts. They allow these chemical reactions to take place basically whenever we want them to, instead of allowing it, you know, kind of like waiting for it to happen spontaneously. How are enzymes controlled? Because of the fact that enzymes basically regulate majority of our metabolic processes, we need to be able to control them. Um, we can control them via the process of activation, which means turning them on, or inhibition, which means turning them off. All right. Activation can occur in a variety of ways. A really common one is uh, the act of phosphorylation or just add a phosphate group to an enzyme. Um, but we're not gonna talk too much about that. What we wanna talk about is kind of the most common method of enzyme control, which is basically just like turning them on. So when we talk about enzyme inhibition, there are two primary methods of enzyme inhibition. We can have what are called competitive inhibitors, and we can have what are called non-competitive inhibitors. 
So what you're looking at at the top of the slide, top right, is what would happen normally for an enzymatic reaction to take place. You would have your substrate bind to the active site, and therefore the reaction could take place, whatever it is, breaking a bond or building a bond. If you were going to turn this enzyme off, there's two ways to do it. The first way you could do it is using a competitive inhibitor. And what would happen is that competitive inhibitor is just a molecule that binds to the active site of an enzyme. So again, that's the active site, competitive, or competitive inhibitor binds to the active site. And what this means is that our substrate actually cannot access the active site and if the substrate can't bind to the active site, then the reaction's not gonna take place, right? Because you have to have the substrate bind to the active site to have the reaction take place. So if the active site is blocked by the competitive inhibitor, then the reaction is not gonna take place. The reason we call it a competitive inhibitor is because it's competing with the substrate for the active site. So it is actively binding to the active site. Alternatively, what can happen is you can have a molecule that binds to an enzyme and also impairs its function, but not, again, by directly binding to the active site, like a competitive inhibitor. In this case, if it's binding to a location other than the active site and turning the enzyme off, the site where it binds is called the allosteric site. Commonly, what happens if an inhibitor binds to the allosteric site is that you still have some sort of impact on the active site. So you can see here what binding to the allosteric site did is it altered the shape of the active site and that prevented your substrate from binding to the enzyme, which would prevent the reaction from taking place. So you still have an impact on the active site, it's just not directly blocking the active site. Right. So again, that's how you can turn an enzyme off. Block the active site with a competitive inhibitor or bind somewhere other than the active site and somehow inhibit the ability of uh, the substrate combining to the active site, both of which would prevent the reaction from taking place. Turning the enzyme off. Right. So, um, we've been talking about how to turn an enzyme off, but you can also impact enzyme functions um, a little more positively. So you have what are called kind of like enhancers as en enzyme functions. So because enzymes are really, really important, there are certain things we can do to kind of enhance their ability to function. You can have what are called prosthetic groups, which are chemical um, molecules that basically permanently bind to an enzyme, permanently kind of enhancing its ability to perform. You can have what are called cofactors, which are inorganic iron uh, ions, which can include iron or zinc. These bind temporarily to an enzyme, but impact its function when they're bound. Or you can have what are called coenzymes, which are organic molecules that do participate um, in the chemical reaction, but they don't change. So these are typically gonna be vitamins, but again, so these are gonna somehow participate in the chemical reaction one way or the other, um, but typically it's by speeding up the chemical reaction. So basically enhancing the enzyme's ability to perform. So there's a lot of ways that it can do this. Um, as well as this, enzyme function can be uh, affected by kind of physical factors such as temperature and pH. For example, if you raise the temperature, if you apply heat, enzyme function typically increases to a certain extent. So you can see this picture on the right is showing the rate of a chemical reaction. So from not happening to happening. And you can see that with this, as the temperature goes up, the rate of the chemical reaction goes up because enzymes are speeding up that chemical reaction. But you can see once you reach a certain threshold, that enzyme function and therefore reaction rate goes down. And this is, has a lot to do with the fact that at certain temperatures, proteins denature. And since the 
a lot of enzymes are proteins. At a certain temperature, those enzymes denature. And so they're not going to function as effectively. But up to a certain level, heat can actually increase enzymatic uh, reaction rate. Same for pH. So certain enzymes function better within a certain range of pHs. So for example, the enzymes in your stomach function best at a low pH. Um, the enzymes like proteases that help in digestion are only activated sometimes in a low pH. All right, so we're gonna be going into metabolism. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how enzymes can be involved in metabolic pathways. So just a reminder that when we talk about metabolism, what we're talking about is all the chemical reactions in the body. But we're gonna be talking about some metabolic pathways which are basically like pretty big series of events that involves uh, linked chemical reactions. So for example, if you've heard about cellular respiration before, you'll know that it occurs in kind of like four general steps. That would be, each of those would be kind of a, meta, a step in the large metabolic pathway that is cellular respiration. Um, so your body has a ton of metabolic pathways, basically coupled or linked um, reactions. And what can happen is you can actually have these metabolic pathways regulate themselves, basically keep going or turn themselves off. So one way that metabolic pathways can regulate whether they keep going or whether they turn off is via the process of um, feedback inhibition. So what this is showing is to kind of orient you to what the slide is showing. You have a starting molecule and then that molecule undergoes a chemical reaction and is changed. So you get your chain, your product. That product ends up being a reaction for the second reaction mediated by a second enzyme. The product of that second reaction is actually a reactant for a third reaction, and so on and so forth. So these are coupled. And in a coupled metabolic pathway, what that means is the reactants, um, the, re the products of one pathway end up being the reactants for the next uh, set of reactions. So you can see we have our reactants going through a reaction, we get our products. This product is the reactant for a second. Uh, series of reactions, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Different enzymes for each reaction. So you have one enzyme for this reaction, one enzyme for this reaction. That's because you need a different enzyme every time you have a different reactant for a different substrate because enzymes are specific for their substrate. And what can happen with feedback inhibition is you get to a certain point in this pathway where you don't need this to take place anymore. Right, let's say that our end goal is to have a lot of product D. And once we get a certain amount of product D, we don't need to keep doing this pathway anymore. Right, so let's say um, if this is like cellular respiration, you're starting with glucose and your product is ATP. Let's say you get to a certain threshold of ATP, you don't need to break down glucose anymore. Right, you want to start storing glucose for later. So what can happen is you can have one of these products actually serve as an inhibitor, right, as an inhibitor for an enzyme in this pathway. So for example, if you have an enzyme that converts A to B, your product of this metabolic pathway could actually be an inhibitor. So once you get enough of this product, that product can actually stop that very first reaction from taking place, therefore shutting down this entire process. So again, that's called feedback inhibition. It's basically a, for a way for these big, long metabolic processes to regulate how much of the final product is produced. All right. So as I mentioned, when we talk about metabolism, metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions in a cell. Um, Anytime you're trans 
transforming energy from potential to kinetic, from kinetic to potential, et cetera. As I mentioned, catabolic reactions release energy, they are exergonic, and anabolic reactions use energy um, for biosynthesis. Whenever you hear the term biosynthesis, think of synthesis meaning create something, bio referring to biological molecules. So biosynthesis is the creation of biological molecules. If you're creating biological molecules, you're building bonds between smaller molecules, so that's anabolic reaction. That's an endergonic reaction. As we talked about when we talked about that slide where we link producers and consumers, it's the circle of life. Uh, anabolic and catabolic reactions are very intimately linked where larger molecules are broken down into smaller molecules via catabolism, energy is released, but those smaller molecules can, with the input of energy, be built via biosynthesis, um, large, can build larger molecules. So metabolism is basically the sum of all of the catabolic and anabolic reactions uh, within a cell or within an organism, whatever you're talking Okay, so I think that's where we're going to stop this little mini lecture and I'll have a second one talking about energy. All right. See you in part two.